Good afternoon and welcome. Um, my name is Deborah Wickering and I teach anthropology here at Aquinas College and I'd like to welcome the students and our faculty who are here and also our guests who have come for this, um, for this lecture. Today we're honored to have Dr. Paul Bieneman to um, one of our professors here at Aquinas and he is going to talk about what the Aquinas campus would have looked at like pre-contact with the Europeans. So uh, we titled it, This Land Was Their Land. After the talk and the um, uh, questions and answers, we're going to have a very brief ceremony out by um, Home Dean in the field out there by what we call Touchdown Mary. And it's going to be a b very brief rededication of ourselves to the land here. So without further ado, let me introduce and welcome um, Dr. Paul Bieneman. Do we need this if I talk loud? Okay. Uh, uh, welcome. It's good to see you. Uh, I'm Paul Bieneman. I've been at Aquinas College since 1975. And during that time, I've walked all around campus a lot of times. And uh, some of you that have been in class have walked around part of the campus with me. So there's a lot of interesting things here, a lot of interesting landforms. And I thought uh, we'd talk a little bit today about how they got to be that way and what things were, were like um, a, a few hundred years ago. So anyway, I think, I think to do that, we probably ought to talk about uh, some of the basic geology that went on in our state, which, which formed the rock beneath the surface. Then we'll talk about uh, the rocks. Then we'll talk about the soils. Then we'll talk about how the surface got to look just the way it does today. So anyway, if we go back in time, and um, geologists have all sorts of... Uh, descriptions of what has happened, and the general summary is something along this line. Starting about 500 million years ago, there was a shallow sea that covered our state, and it covered parts of the surrounding states as well. Uh, sediments washed into that shallow sea, and those sediments um, settled to the bottom of the sea, and more sediments washed in, and more sediments washed in, and that went on for 300 million years. So starting 500 million years or so ago is about the time the sea formed. This was not a sea like today's ocean, but it was a fairly shallow sea. And at times it was only a few feet deep. Sometimes it was swampy. Sometimes it was a couple of hundred feet deep. Um, it was connected to the ocean, but was not a part of the ocean as far as a major connecting link. So sometimes water ran in from the ocean and uh, evaporated here. In addition to all of those sorts of things, it was at the same time that continental drift was taking place. And continental drift is the idea that the Earth's plates, the crusts, are drifting around. So our climate changed, and our climate changed during those times as a result of the, of the continental drift. So anyway, as a result of this whole series of, uh, of, of seas that covered our state, rocks got settled into the bottom, and the, settle, uh, the settling in the bottom continued more in the middle and on the edges. So most of the rock layers are bowl-shaped. Each successive layer then was smaller than the previous one because the, the sea was filling in. So the first layer that formed in the bottom uh, is called the Cambrian layer. And that layer formed during the times, very originally known as Cambrian times. And that, that time period, the stuff that washed into the sea was primarily sandstone. And the sand that washed in had an iron uh, stain to it, so it stained. And I think all of you know that about iron stains. You ever throw have iron in your washing machine, it stains all the white stuff kind of a reddish orange. So about 6,000 feet beneath the surface, we've got this layer of reddish uh, sandstone. If you want to see it, all you have to do is go to Pictured Rocks or to Covenant Falls because that's at the edge of the basin and there the stuff is visible. But here, it's about 6,000 feet down. After the Cambrian layer got deposited, uh, climatic conditions changed somewhat. The sea got deeper and the next layer is a Silurian layer. So on top of that sandstone is a layer of limestone. And that limestone is the whitish soft limestone that uh, settled out in the bottom of that uh, shallow sea. Then. Uh, also during uh, part of the Silurian, we had, we had an Ordovician time between it. We didn't talk about Ordovician stuff, doesn't amount to much, but um, there's some Ordovician stuff. Silurian times, we were connected to uh, the ocean by a, a, a fairly narrow link, and ocean water ran in and it evaporated because we were in a warm climate and a dry climate. And if you think about the climates on the Earth's surface today, they're in bands. You know, there's the tropical areas, there's the dry areas, there's the mid-latitude climates, there's the polar areas. So we were in a dry climate at the time, and the shallow sea evaporated. So much water evaporated that we ended up with 2,000 feet of salt. So beneath our campus today and beneath Grand Rapids is 2,000 feet of salt. Uh, one layer alone is 500 feet th or is 1,500 feet thick. 
So sometimes people say, well, why don't we open a salt mine on our campus? We could employ our students there. We could make uh, good, good mining money, and we could sell the salt. Think about the layer again. It's like a bowl. And if you were going to mine that, it would be much easier to mine it at the edge of the bowl than it would in the middle, where you'd have to go down deeper. So when you go to the western edge of the state, to Muskegon and Whitehall and Ludington and Manistee, all those areas, they're bringing the salt up there because it's closer to the surface. On the eastern part of the state, uh, by Detroit and north of Detroit, on both the American and Canadian side, they're uh, mining it there as well. The mining is not the kind of mine you, tr you traditionally think of. You think of a mine as a shaft going down into the ground and then tunnels going off from that. We generally mine the salt by, uh, by wells. We put wells down, and if there's not already water there, we put a secondary well down, we pump water down, and we bring the brine up to the surface. So nobody goes underground. There used to be a salt mine at, at Detroit where we mined it in the traditional mining method, the rock salt we spread on the roads. But the other stuff, we bring it up by those wells. Because the, the salt is corrosive, it eats up the pipe, destroys the pipe. And so most of those wells then have that uh, derrick that looks like an oil derrick over the top where they have to replace the pipe occasionally when it rusts out. On top of that uh, Silurian layer, we have a Devonian layer. So the next, the next layer up is called Devonian rock. It was named after Devonshire, where the same type of rock occurs. And uh, that rock is the one that has our petroleum in it. So again, there are parts of the state where we have petroleum on the edge of Grand Rapids, west side of Grand Rapids. There are a number of wells that tap into petroleum in the, in the Devonian layer. Then on top of that, hey, we're getting closer to the surface. On top of that is the, the Mississippian layer. And the Mississippian layer is the one that has the gypsum in. So if, you've, uh, if you grew up in Grand Rapids, you probably toured the gypsum mine as a sixth grader. That's when um, you know, gypsum was discovered at Plaster Creek in 1827 on the south side of town. Gypsum is the main ingredient in plaster, drywall plaster, so that's what it gets used for. So if we have an inexhaustible resource in our state, it's probably the gypsum, and there's a lot of gypsum beneath the surface. I think the last gypsum mine closed in Grand Rapids a few years ago. It was next to the expressway uh, on the way to Jenison. On top of that, the, the last of the layers was a layer that's, that's called the Pennsylvanian layer. And uh, here where we're standing today is very close to the edge of where that sea was. So the stuff that's settled in the bottom of that sea is the stuff that you can see when you go to Grand Ledge. So if you've seen the limestone and the sandstone layers there, that, that settled out in that sea. There was some organic stuff that settled to the bottom, and that became the coal. And if you go to uh, that same area, you can see little layers of coal. We mined it in our state for a while. Well, anyway, those are the layers that are beneath our campus. That's the stuff you can't see. If you dug a hole deep enough, you could see that. Uh, there probably wouldn't be much return. Your chance of striking oil would be minimal, so all you'd see is the rock. But on the surface of that, this, those shallow seas all ended uh, probably about 200 million years ago. So then, uh, if you want to uh, think about what happened then, we don't know. So, oh, we can give it a, a oh, we ought to give it a classy title. So when you look in uh, sixth grade geography books, it says the Lost Era. And the lost era is that time from about 300 million years ago till about one or two million years ago. And the reason it's lost is whatever was there got destroyed by the glaciers. So now that brings us up to uh, one to two million years ago. And at that time, it started to snow around Hudson Bay. More snow fell in the wintertime than what melted the following summers. And as the snow built up, it oozed out from both sides of Hudson Bay. It, moved, it oozed north, it oozed south, and it pushed through Michigan. And it pushed as about as far south, the ice did, about as far south as the Ohio and Missouri rivers. So we've got layers of stuff underneath our campus that was deposited by four different advancements of ice. Uh, so the ice came, and then the ice went. And then the ice came, and the ice disappeared again. So ice is always pushing forward, but sometimes it's moving so slowly that it melts faster than it pushes forward. So we say the leading edge of the ice receded. So anyway, uh, there, there's big arguments going on today as to uh, how long each of those ice advancements lasted. We used to say they lasted a couple hundred thousand years, and then the ice disappeared for probably 20,000 years, and then the ice came back again for a couple hundred thousand years. During some of those interglacial times, uh, the climates were warmer than they are today. So, uh, you know, climates do change, and they change in the past. Well, the last uh, layer of ice that came was the Wisconsin ice advancement, and that's what produced what we, what we see on our campus today. I often ask uh, people in class uh, uh, why pancakes are round. And they say, well, if you pour the batter in the middle of a griddle, the batter oozes out on all sides and is round. And I say, well, it's the same way the glaciers oozed out from central Canada. They ooze north and south and east and west. 
Then I said, well, that's because uh, the pancakes are probably because your uh, griddle is clean. If you have a lump of uh, burnt bacon or old sausage or something that's stuck in there, then you could produce a pancake with scalloped edges. Well, as the glaciers came south from Canada, some of the highland areas in the, in the northern part of our state slowed down the ice just like um, froze or just like uh, burnt on uh, bacon would slow down the flowing of the batter on the griddle. So Michigan, uh, oh, Michigan. Uh, we had one, one uh, lobe of ice that pushed through Saginaw Bay, one that came through Lake Michigan, and one that came through the Lake Erie, Lake Huron area. And they met in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, right downtown at the Amway Grand, uh, is a very close spot to where they met. The west side of town was deposited by the lobe of ice that came through Lake Michigan. And the east side, where we are, is uh, a series of deposits from the lobe of ice that came through Saginaw Bay. And if you think about the two sides of town, they're considerably different. If I ask you to name the biggest lake on the west edge of town between Grand Rapids and Lake Michigan, most people have to think a long time because there aren't hardly any. If I ask you to name the lakes on the east side of town, you know, just over the hill is Reeds Lake and Fisk Lake and East and West and Mid Lake and, and Church Lake and Loch Lomond and Twin Lakes and a whole bunch of swamps all out on the east side of town. So we've got more clay on our side of town. The west side of town has a little more sand. And the river downtown from about Comstock Park to uh, near Granville flows down along the boundary of those two lobes of ice, the deposits from those two lobes of ice. So anyway, to get us to where Aquinas College is today, uh, the Wisconsin ice sheet pushed into this area. Um, they thought, uh, the general thought is that uh, glaciers were in the southern part of our state about 12,500 years ago. Then uh, they melted back, and they melted back uh, rapidly enough. The leading edge receded into Canada. The glaciers re-advanced and buried a forest in the Upper Peninsula. And that forest has had the radiocarbon dating of the, of the wood, and it was radiocarbon dated at 9,727 years ago, give or take a few. So we can assume that the glacier then was here in East Grand Rapids, right on the east edge of our campus, probably about 10 or 11, or maybe 12,000 years ago. 11,000 might be a round number that we could that we could choose. So anyway, because of the ice, and because of the thickness, and because of all of the water that was tied up in it, as the, as the glacier melted, the ice, um, of course, disappeared, and the water gushed across our campus. And we had two channels, and one of them is right outside this building. It's along a little stream called Coldbrook. And that Coldbrook uh, channel starts at, uh, at Fisk Lake. Reeds Lake flows into Fisk Lake, which runs across our campus and flows on down through here and uh, flows into the other little stream, which doesn't have a name, the one that flows behind uh, uh, Regina Hall and Ruby Hall and flows along through that kind of a wooded area. And the two flow together by, uh, um, by the southwest side of our campus, not too far from the dorm, not too far from the field house, by the parking lot that people call the flood lot. And the reason we call it the flood lot is obviously because uh, we have a grate across the pipe. Oh, the stream partially is buried. It's kind of sad. It used to be a stream, now it's in a pipe that's underground. There's a grate across the end to keep children and dogs from being washed in. It also keeps out sticks, stems, and leaves. And when the sticks, stems, and leaves plug up the end of the pipe, the water rises rapidly and floods that part of, uh, part of our campus. But anyway, so our campus then is primarily made up of kind of a rolling glacial landscape with two stream channels in it, one on the north side of our campus, the other one right outside this building. Um, if you look at those streams today, they're fairly small. You could jump across them. But in the past, they were probably uh, four or five times as wide as this room is long. And you can see that channel just as plain as can be. So if you go over by the Performing Arts Center, you see that big flat area? Uh, I'll call it a floodplain. If you go over by uh, behind Regina Hall, there's a big flat area. We'll call that a floodplain. People like to call it Regina Bowl, but it's, it's the floodplain for those two streams. And <coughs> those two streams carried great amount of glacial meltwaters. So uh, several hundred years ago, if you'd have showed up at Aquinas College, you would have basically noticed uh, those two stream channels and the flat floodplains and this nice windy bank, this uh, really neat bank along the edge. Uh, that has since been changed somewhat because of the construction of buildings. We've knocked down the bank and flattened out a few places. But for the most part, uh, what we have today is fairly similar to what the landforms looked like in the past. Now, we've altered them some to uh, build roads and to flatten out spot for buildings, but otherwise, the two streams and their associated floodplains and uh, 
the divide that runs down the center of our campus. Kind of an interesting thing. If you think of divides, most people probably don't, but divides are the boundary lines between drainage basins. We think of the continental divide. We've got the great Aquinas divide, if you want to call that crest of the hill where Home Dean and Regina Hall are located on as a divide. Um, throughout our state, divides are good places to build roads and everything else you don't want to flood. And so we've got parts of our campus built there which obviously won't flood. But anyway, as I said, much of what we see on our campus today is quite similar to the way the landforms looked 10,000 years ago, except for the flattening out of the spots where we built buildings. So anyway, that's a general uh, description of what our campus uh, looked like uh, pre-contact time. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Deb? Probably not a, not a whole lot of use for anything uh, in the line of, of raising any crops. You know, we hear about uh, oh, Plainfield Township, the next township to the north. The reason it's called Plainfield Township is there was a plain field there. And that's the one where there's now a gravel pit right at the intersection of East Beltline and uh, Cannonsburg Road. Uh, the Aquinas campus is probably a wooded area that you could use for gathering and for hunting. And there was a trail. Robinson Road was the trail from downtown Grand Rapids to Ada. Uh, if you think about what the Grand River looks like, Let's see, the Grand River comes along, and it gets to Ada, and then it turns north, makes that big loop, and then comes through downtown Grand Rapids. Well, the shortcut from the river to the river was uh, right, a, right next to our campus here on Robinson Road, and that was the trail. And if you think about uh, how many roads in town aren't uh, on a grid system, you know, how many are depart from that, and it's not very many, and Robinson Road is one of them because that was an early day trail. But, but hunting and, and gathering would have been the main thing our campus would have been used for. And there's a few parts of our campus probably where the, the natural vegetation is pretty well similar to what it was behind, uh, behind Home Dean, where those big trees are, where nobody's really done much, is probably uh, a lot of what our campus looked like. I mean, the trees have been cleared, but uh, in the past, uh, those large trees are probably there. And you can see there's not much growing underneath them. There's a lot of squirrels around. They're pretty happy, so a little hunting probably went on here. But um, the flatter lands down by the river were generally be better agricultural places. And, and uh, the Colebrook area out here, at least portions of it, I think, uh, at early times, people talk about uh, the fish that used to come upstream there. So I would think that, that early people would certainly uh, be, do something to do with uh, gathering the fish there. We've kind of messed it all up downtown, but Coldbrook flows into the Grand River, um, well, by the Coldbrook pumping station and by Coldbrook School. And uh, right on the, on the north side of that hill with the big X on, by the Choo Choo little uh, restaurant there, if you're familiar with those kind of places, not far from there. So there probably was fishing that at least uh, in the spring when fish go upstream to spawn, there probably were some fish that you could, that you could gather there as well. Oh, same type we find here pretty much today. I mean, there's, uh, there aren't many deer here from time to time today, but there were deer in the past. And um, squirrels were probably the main sorts of things. There are probably you know, a few of the other kind of standard animals. Probably were some bears in our in this part of the state and probably some rabbits. But when you think about what heavily wooded areas are like, there's not a lot of ground cover on the, on the, on the surface for, for animals. It, it's worked out to be much better for many of them today because we've got a lot of surface area where, edge area where sunlight hits the forest floor and you get more of a growth of plants than they would in a heavily wooded area. But there certainly were, were deer and, and rough grouse and, and rabbits and squirrels and uh, some in bigger numbers than others, obviously. Okay, anyone else have a question? Oh, divides. Divides are, are really interesting things. Uh, they're the boundary lines between drainage basins. And drainage basins are where the water collects for a particular stream. So the whole area where the water uh, that, the, that runs off after the rain flows into the Grand River would be the Grand River uh, drainage basin. And the boundary of that would be the divide. So the divides are usually uh, ridges. And on one side, the water runs into one stream. And on the other side, it runs into the other. So um, when you go up by Homedean, the, the divide runs right under Regina Hall. And it goes right through. There's, there's a, a little roadway there. It's, it goes very close to Homedean. It goes just on this side of Homedean. It's kind of the crest of the hill. 
So if you think about being there, the fire trucks are always on campus for some reason. Or let's assume one of them sprang a leak at the top of the hill. So if the water ran into that stream, it would be on the other side of the divide. If it was on this side, it would be this side of the divide. So it's the crest of that ridge or the crest of the hill. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, uh, it was. Yeah, from Ada and the Grand Rind River to downtown Grand Rapids. I don't know of anything that's there. Uh, the archaeological stuff that I'm generally familiar with are things that happen downtown along the floodplain along the river there. Um, and sometimes, you know, when people think about uh, archaeological stuff in our state, they say, well, gee, there should be good archaeological things over along the Lake Michigan Beach. Well, the Lake Michigan Beach is a real recent beach. Uh, the water used to be f way far offshore. After the glaciers left 10,000 years ago, the, the lakes drained down to about a quarter of their size. And so if you wanted to be on the beach and have any evidence there, that would have been offshore. So that's why, you know, beach-type things aren't near as plentiful as you'd think they ought to be. But in this area, I'm not familiar with anything other than in the Ada and the downtown region, been nothing much along the, the walkway trail that connected the two. Yes? There's a higher clay content in the soil. Yes, the water wouldn't drain away as rapidly. If you, if you think about that, well, let's assume you're a, a weird, sadistic kind of a person. Um, you could drain Reed's Lake dry with a little bit of work, and you could dredge your channel out here, and the lake would go dry. Reed's Lake is about 150 feet, the surface of the lake is about 150 feet above the river downtown. So the lakes around here are lakes you know, almost on hilltops, and they're quite high, and it's because there's enough clay in the soil that it keeps the water from, from just percolating down into the soil. On the west side of town, where there's a lot more sand, uh, there, there just aren't so many. But we've got a lot of swamps and depressions on the east side of town that have water in them. And, and that's, again, that uh, Saginaw lobe just deposited more, more clay-like materials than the uh, Lake Michigan lobe did. Okay, anyone else have anything they wish to say? Okay, otherwise, thanks for listening. Yeah.